Okay, we might get going. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to this panelist session we have on equity and gender-based violence, linking prevention and response. My name is Jackie DeLacy. I'm Managing Director of Apt Associates in Australia, and it's my privilege to be able to moderate this panel today. I'm uh, doing this panel session where I'm, although we're all virtual, um, I'm actually doing the panel session from Canberra in the ACT in Australia, which is Ngunnawal land. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend those, uh, res that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us for this session today. Um, we've got a great lineup. We have three incredible speakers who will talk to us about their direct experience working on gender-based violence across the region. Um, and I will introduce each of them shortly. But uh, first, a little bit of um, housekeeping. Uh, for our panelists, we're just reminded for everyone to be mute unless you're speaking, just to avoid any feedback. Um, to everyone who is listening online, we do have the chat function which on WebEx, so please uh, click on the chat box and if you have questions that you want to ask the panellists, please put those questions into the chat box and Lisa Gibson who from Apt Associates who's helped coordinate that will help facilitate us getting those questions at the end of the session. Um, as you all know, we're here as part of the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, which is an annual international campaign to call for the prevention and elimination of violence against women and girls worldwide. This year's global campaign theme, Orange the World, End Violence Against Women Now, and I'm trying to wear orange, this, was, this is my orange shirt, aims to mobilise all networks, civil society and women's rights organisations, government partners, schools, universities, the private sector, including companies like Apt Associates, sporting clubs and associations, as well as individuals, to mobilise all of those groups to do three things. To one, advocate for inclusive, comprehensive and long-term strategies and programs and resources to prevent and eliminate violence against women and girls in public and private spaces and prioritising the most marginalised women and girls in that process. The second thing we're all being mobilised to do is to amplify the success stories, and I hope we hear a few of them today, that demonstrate that violence against women and girls is preventable. So we really want to showcase effective strategies and interventions to inspire all of us around what works and to scale that up. And the third thing we want to do is promote the leadership of women and girls in their diversity and their meaningful participation in policy making and in decision making uh, from global to local networks. And it's wonderful to have three really powerful and talented women presenting with us today. During the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, Apt Associates, I'm really proud to announce, is launching our Gender Equality, Disability and Social Inclusion Framework, or our GEDC Framework, as we call it, as part of our company-wide commitment to equity. Through this framework, we will work on broader gender in work on broader gender inequality, targeting those most marginalised and deliberately promote the leadership of women and girls in this space. Preventing and responding to gender-based violence is strongly linked to challenging racism and harmful gender norms. And I know we're going to talk about some of those gender norms today, as well as to promoting uh, disability rights and shifting the way we respond to disability. APPS policies are part of our global efforts to end violence against people of all genders. APT is a global company and we operate in many countries around the world um, uh, and, and in communities across those countries and regions. And today we have three amazing panellists, one from the Philippines, one from Fiji and one from Papua New Guinea. So we've focused on panellists from our part of the world, from Southeast Asia, to hear about their experiences on gender-based violence. So let me introduce the three amazing panellists that we have, and then we will get into a discussion with, and, and I'll stop talking and start listening. 
So Gina Hong Lee is joining us from Fiji. So Gina has spent 21 years of her professional career in Fiji and the Pacific. And for the past 11 years, she was employed at the Regional Rights Resource Team, or Triple RT as it's called, which is the human rights program of the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, which works right across the Pacific. Her background is in training in gender and human rights. And while at the Pacific Community, she provided program oversight of the Violence Against Women project on addressing violence against women legislative change. Gina is a former chair of the Fiji Women's Rights Movement and has served on the Board of Leadership Fiji and Asia Pacific Forum for Women, Law and Development Regional Council. Gina is currently undertaking gender-based violence costing project in Fiji together with APT Associates and has recently been appointed the chair of the Women's, Fiji, Women's Fund for Fiji, WFF, Board of Trustees. And WFF is the Pacific's first national women's fund providing grants and capacity development support to diverse women, girls, and gender non-conforming groups, networks, and organizations to further their work in gender justice and human rights. So it is great pleasure to welcome you, Gina, to with joining us today. The second panelist I'd like to introduce you all to is Carmela Castro, or Mia, as she prefers to be called from the Philippines. Um, Mia is an attorney and she is an expert on children's rights, women's issues and working with, with non-profit organisations. She has over 15 years experience in the areas of family law and criminal litigation as a management executive and attorney. And Mia has solidified her reputation within the industry and in 2016 received the Outstanding Young Men and Women Award for her contributions to society on law and child protection. During the course of her career, Mia has been at the forefront of women and children's issues, having successfully prosecuted dozens of child abuse, child sex trafficking and violence against women and children cases. In 2010, Mia was also the recipient of an award from the Philippines National Police in recognition of her significant contributions to the enhancement and investigation of anti-human trafficking cases across, across the Philippines. Mia was the managing director of Concello Zobal Alger Foundation, one of the Philippines' most established philanthropic organisations. She also headed the Manila Office of International Justice Mission, a human rights organisation based in Washington, D.C. Mia is also a member of the Philippine Inter-Country Adoption Board under its Inter-Country Placements Committee. So welcome, Mia. And the third panellist that we've got the pleasure of listening to today is Nancy Aboga, who I'm very proud to say is one of our own. She's an APT Associates employee. Nancy is the Senior Program Manager for Gender Equality and Social Inclusion at the Australian Government Funded PATH Program, which is um, the PNG Australia Transition to Health Program in Papua New Guinea. During the course of her career, Nancy has had a strong focus on gender-based violence prevention, response and empowerment of women and girls, having been involved in the Water and Sanitation Program, which have a proven record of continuously building capacities of partners and rural communities on gender-based violence prevention, response and community-led total sanitation. In addition to this, Nancy contributed to a gender-based violence program targeted at schools, which focused on adolescent health. Nancy has over 12 years of experience working for international NGOs based in PNG on programs with a focus on health and gender, and more specifically around gender-based violence prevention, gender-based violence response, male advocacy programs, contraception, family planning, and adolescent sexual reproductive health. So three amazing panelists, all with a lot of really direct frontline experience working on prevention and response to gender-based violence, lots of experience between them. I can't wait to hear their stories. So 
Um, so to start off, can you tell us a little about the work that you do in GBV? And I'll go to Gina first. Um, Nusa Bulavinaka, um, thank you, Jackie, for that introduction. Um, I'm actually here in New Zealand and oh. not in Fiji, but uh, in this uh, global world, we of course uh, move around in the Pacific. But anyway, Nisa Bulavinaka, Kiora, Namaste, Talofalava, Kiorana, Malolele, Fakalofa Lahiatu, Talohi, Halo Olgeta, Kamna Maori, Kiora. Warm greetings and hello to everyone. Um, yes, I've been, um, I started my work in the area of uh, gender and development by working at the Fiji Women's Rights Movement. And um, this work was uh, really as a, in, you know, working in terms of uh, advocacy and using um, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women as its uh, framework and it was more of an advocacy um, a lobbying organization strongly promoting the human rights of women um, and then my work on gbv is then when i moved to uh, spc triple rt and this was um, working in the area of um, advocating and lobbying for comprehensive violence against women legislation this was of course the inadequacies of the laws in our pacific region um, in that, you know, in some instances, we had no specific um, protection orders written into the law. Um, so uh, this work was on uh, building up um, networks and building up civil society organization to demand for uh, better legislation, better comprehensive violence against women legislation. Um, I'm um, and, and then now I'm doing some work on looking at um, the costing of uh, violence against women. Uh, that is the economic cost of um, violence. But then what is it that we can cost out in terms of national measures um, in Fiji uh, to look at how is it that we can look at uh, whichever respective settings and how is it that we can build up uh, what would be the cost so that it can form a tool to uh, encourage and address uh, within the systemic ways of you, you looking at gender responsive budgeting and planning. So uh, that's just a little bit about me and my work. Thanks a lot, Gina. I've got to remember to unmute myself every time. Um, it would be lovely, Mia, if you could just tell us a little bit about the work you've done in GBV, and then we'll get to some more specific questions that go a bit deeper. Okay. Hi, Jackie. Thank you very much for having me. Mabuhay to everyone, as we say here from sunny Philippines. So my name is Mia Castro, and I've had the privilege of working in the space of gender-based violence uh, from the standpoint of um, prevention, uh, protection of survivors and victims, and prosecution as well. Um, I've really concentrated more on the NGO space, uh, leading teams that uh, uh, would educate communities, um, families, young girls in communities, and working as well with survivors or victims um, as they go through the effects of um, trauma caused by gender-based violence and the other side, the other end of the spectrum, which is equally important, prosecution and law enforcement um, in ensuring that um, perpetrators are held to account. So thank you for having me and special hello to my fellow panelists. Such an honor to be here in this room with all of you. Thank you, Mia. Um, Nancy, could I get you to tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing on gender-based violence in Papua New Guinea? Hi everyone, uh, from PNG, good play day. Uh, it's midday, so it means good day. Um, so my work in GBV is specific to GBV prevention and response from the uh, health perspective. So more to, more to addressing harmful uh, gender norms, societal norms within, embedded within the community. And the approach that was taken, we took up the socio-ecological model socio-ecological uh, ecological model uh, specifically focused on the tipping points as to where the issues are and how the issues are addressed and who should do that. 
So working with individuals to communities, homes, and then you have the institutions and the policies. So in PNG, the level of GBV compared may be comparable to others, but as similar to experiences from other communities as well. So to do this and be more effective in uh, responding to community uh, GBV prevention at a community level, uh, we got so much support from the uh, stakeholders, specifically the government. <clears throat> when I say government, I'm referring to the specific health agencies that are very supportive to the idea of ending violence against women and addressing violence against women. So we have uh, support from FSGAC, uh, Family Sexual Violence Action Committees in Country, that support the work of uh, NGOs as well, the initiatives taken up by the NGOs. And then we have the National Department of Health that stepped in to support. So every work we did was not just um, being alone. What we saw was when you work in partnership with the others, you increase the ways of women, you'll be able to address that. So that's the space that I worked in when it comes to the community prevention. And when it comes to the health response specifically, to building the capacity of health workers. So most of my time was spending um, supporting the National De uh, Department of Health to develop tools on capacity building. So mostly mo um, development of materials. There are experts in Papua New Guinea who have supported in that work and they've framed the modules, the training materials to ensure that the capacities of each of the health workers in specific provinces are addressed and the skills are addressed as well. So apart from just responding to the health uh, workers, we also responded to um, law enforcers, specifically the police. Um, the role in there was to ensure that gender-based violence is not seen as normal. It must be seen as an issue for the country. It has to be seen as an issue to be addressed by the law itself as well. So those kind of uh, um, movement that we had, we made, try to make, uh, change the the idea of the way people think. They have to think GBV is not normal. So those uh, different dimensions that we took, try to bring all the voices at different levels come together to address gender-based violence. So be, gender-based violence being normal, we want to say that it's not normal. So women have to say gender-based violence is not normal and we have to speak up. So at various levels of GBV, women say they take different options. They either move to the silent mode or they either go to other people they trust and there are others as well. So it's not normal. Gender-based is not normal. So I'm going to talk more on that uh, when the when, uh, when, uh, moderator asks more of the questions then I can address. There's, there's lots to say. Thanks so much, Nancy. I mean, it might be good to stay with you now and talk a little bit more about those gender norms. I mean, I think it's really powerful, the first one that you've raised, which is to shift everyone's perceptions that gender-based violence everywhere, but in Papua New Guinea where you work, is not normal and um, encouraging women to speak out about that. But could you... Could you talk a little bit more about the about these unhelpful norms that you're trying to address, and and what are you doing with other groups besides um, women who are potentially the victims of violence? Thanks, Jackie. So I love to continue. The uh, exclusionary factors, the exclusion, are seen at different levels. So in country like. Uh, certain countries see exclusion as leaving someone behind, not getting that service. So. When it comes to the traditional norms of leaving a woman behind in decision making, women not getting involved in uh, the say they should say, the words they should say, but they're not allowed because the traditions they value. So when I say traditional values, these are values that, are rem that remain within the cultural systems. And if a woman is married, they are tied to the tradition, they are uh, uh, tied to the tribes, and the norms that are within the system. So the barriers that uh, uh, 
uh, that are leading to women not speaking up, women being silent. It's also within the values that they hold on to, to say that I'm a woman, I live in this system. So in other, other, other uh, aspect, it will be seen as something like it's, they, they think it's normal, but the woman who's feeling the pain, it's not normal. Men may think it's normal, but a woman who's feeling the pain thinks it's normal. It's not safe for them. So that happens within the space where we, uh, we as women face within the communities, uh, within our domestic families. But then when it goes out to the community, there are gender norms that surrounds it, especially when bright price comes in. So the effect of bright price um, may take women as, uh, as a commodity to say that um, I paid bright price, so you have expectations to meet. So we women have to meet those expectations. So some of us want to fight that off. We want to see a bright price as something that brings families together to appreciate this and exchange in marriages and to encourage that, yes, we live as families in the societies in PNG. But we should do away with the norms that say that you have expectations to meet the obligations of a family. So those are some of the norms. But when it comes to participation at the levels of socio-economical participation for women, uh, access to finance and the capacity to, to be built, I mean, they have that opportunity to participate in making money. They, they, need, they, they need to um, help uh, and meet for the, themselves and the families that they take care of. So when I say families, and we're looking at vulnerable women, we're looking at women with disability and those who are already exposed to gender-based violence and also the victims, specifically the girls. So young girls who are going to school, maybe in the rural communities where accessibility by road, um, we have those ge geographical locations where girls are not able to access those services to come to school. So we would think that girls should come to school, but they may not because the traditions would say that she can't go to school. The boy has to go to school. So some of those many um, situations still exist within the uh, space that I'm working in. And also in other ways, I've, uh, from my years of working from since 2000, uh, 2010 to now, there are changes that happened along the way. So previously, women will, uh, men will say GBV is not normal. Uh, they would take it as normal. And just recently, we see women coming out and saying it's not normal. I should go and access the service. So we encourage more investment into women, more in, uh, more saying into women, I can do it kind of attitude. So women feel empowered and say that I can access the service. So, so the battle of uh, really fighting of the cultural norms, the traditions that we see, as I believe it's the values itself. If they can fight of the traditions, it's the value that they could. Because at one point they might say, yes, I can, but something else will bring them back to come back to their normal again. So to do things out of the odd, like to do things for themselves, maybe specifically to save themselves from violence that lead to fatal um, consequences. So fatal consequences are referring to a death, a permanent um, disabilities, a permanent uh, impairment of the body. So those kind of things that are really personally affecting uh, humans daily living especially for girls, especially for women. For such situations, women do fight for their lives. They try to come out of it. And some things like when it comes, I worked in the space of family planning where you have women are giving birth one after another and there's not proper spacing. At some point, the woman would have to say, I will take family planning. I have to go for family planning. So those are case scenarios that happen in the rural communities where the where the tribes or the families will have to decide for a woman whether to take a family planning or not. So actually, I would say it's the decision itself that they have to participate in. Women have to be given the power to say that I can do it and I will take on family planning service. I will go to GBV service. I won't be silent. But then it's the support system that is in place. Now I'm referring to the referral pathway systems. 
Now, if we lack the confidence in our own service provision space, so if we say, I cannot trust this service and I can take it because I don't feel confident about it. So I was thinking that at some point the programs would want to support the policy and as well as the health service system. Then it will make a woman feel safe to get take the service they need. And, and there's lots of issues like the financial issues they could have access to, but they don't have the capital to start off with. So they could be empowered. Once they empower, they will be able to stand up and say, I can do it. So I believe in this space that we're working on gender-based violence and gender inclusion. Maybe somewhere out, somewhere out there, someone is saying, even now that I'm speaking, they want to feel safe. They want to feel good about the service they so that's what I want to feel about APT Associate as well when I'm working in the space of as an organization. How do I feel safe in my own organization? Because when I come from uh, outside and I'm in, in, in the organization itself, how does it help me out so I can reach out to those services safely? Um, some of the things are very much associated with fear when accessing service, They're associated with fear. Um, a GBV associated with shame, the shame itself, that <clears throat> someone may be ashamed of accessing that service. So those are some of the norms that I just said, maybe, but I can share that country data as now because we're just generally sharing what I feel as a woman and I believe other women are feeling the same. We just want to be feeling safe, feel empowered. And even if someone has a disability, a woman with a disability can say, I can stand up and say something. Yeah, the courage to say something, courage to make a decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe in those systems. That's great, Nancy. Um, you've touched on many really interesting and relevant points here. You've talked about harmful cultural practices or how the, how cultural practices are interpreted in harmful ways for women. You've talked about the really critical importance of empowerment of women and raising women's voice and agency. You've talked about access to services, whether that's financial systems, so women can be financially independent or education for girls. You've also talked, which I think is highly relevant, um, around how we all have an obligation to make our workplaces safe and what we can do to support our own workforce, get access to good services and the challenges of service delivery. Um, I might throw it uh, to Gina and Mia because no doubt some of these themes really resonate with each of you. So I'd love to get your reflections on this broader issue of the sort of broader gender norms that are affecting or that are underpinning the problems of gender-based violence. Mia, I think Thank you are. You. Okay, yes. Go ahead, Mia. Oh, oh, no. Okay, no, I was just going, wanted to say that how um, what uh, um, Nancy has highlighted was, you know, in, you know, coming from the Pacific, this is a really urgent problem. I mean, we have such a high rate. I mean, we have um, the fact that, you know, um, there is the global average of intimate partner violence, physical and or sexual violence of women is at 30%. And yet, Pacific women report higher levels of violence. We are looking at, um, you know, of the 12 countries that have taken this research, you know, Kiribati is at 68%, Fiji at 64%, um, Solomon Islands, 64%, um, and Vanuatu, 60%. So we are, you know, this is a really sort of um, really urgent. Um, and very important, uh, this is an urgent problem that we have to deal with in our region. And I would just reiterate again, that whole, what Nancy was sharing in terms of that whole cultural and um, basis of the, the norms, like, you know, um, that kind of in the household, at the private domain, in the private space, if we con contribute this, these norms that, you know, um, men are the head of households, that they are the controlling point of the head of households, um, then it becomes part of these these cultural acceptance. And it becomes, you know, you know, statements that people say, well, it's in our culture to hit women if they don't do the housework. Um, you know, hitting, um, you know, it, it, not just men who uh, perpetuate that norm, but also women then think that that's justified, that that actually is a reason that they uh, you know, it's okay to be hit because they uh, didn't, 
you know, put the food on table on time or that they, uh, you know, didn't come and, ho and be at home at the right time. So all these controlling behaviors, all these social norms that contribute once again to uh, the suppression or that the fact that women are unable to be empowered or to be to have a voice. I think I just wanted to highlight the role of um, the law or the legislation and how important it is to, you know, try to uh, put in place this comprehensive violence against women uh, legislation, because what you're trying to do is that when the law um, is a is a very powerful tool, because if the law is saying that this is a violation, that this is wrong, this is how the law can respond, that it actually is the responsibility of the police, that it is the responsibility of service providers to address this the, the, the women in need or the victim of um, domestic violence. If you put that in place, you're actually making a structural change. You're trying to look at what what can the system do to then address the, the very real problem that we have. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Gina, can I just ask a follow up question on that? Because I know when you work for the Pacific community, you did a lot of work on trying to get the legislative basis right across the Pacific. How is it now? Like when you look across the Pacific and look at the legislative protections for women and girls around gender based violence. How is there still a lot of work to go, or have we made a lot totally. of Totally. Even that was my sort of, you know, I was so geared towards trying to change the legislation and supporting this legislative change that actually um, there has been, that's the positive. You know, we have seen some shift and movement in that actually now you have legislation that, you know, is. Um, allows to put in place protection orders, does allow being able to have a response, but it's not over because the harder work, it, we can pass these laws, the harder work is the implementation, rolling this out, getting a cultural shift within all the service providers. This, this, is, this is ongoing. This is still the work that we have to do. So I would have to say that the work is not done we have to still continue. We have to be vigilant to see that when we say that, you know, the police officers are sensitized and trained, are they because they still, you know, exist in the system where they are affected by their own cultural norms. So you have to retrain, rechange, you know, you have to keep the work. So I wouldn't say that it's over. It's actually even more harder that we now still have to manage and monitor the implementation of these laws. Thanks. I mean, Mia, it would be good for you to get off mute. I mean, you, I mean, one, it would be good to get your reaction to the broader issue of gender norms and how they're influencing this. But you've worked at the, really at the front line of working with the justice system to ensure that where there are legal protections, they're actually used to protect women and girls. But um, love to hear from you on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Um, it's so interesting how uh, we're so, far away from Nancy and Gina, like in terms of time and space, but our experience and insights are so similar. And uh, I'd like to start by just framing uh, what I'm about to say that my experience on gender-based violence has really focused more on um, domestic violence against women, um, child sexual abuse, incest, um, sex trafficking. And through the years I've seen uh, how girls, um, women, have always been here in the Philippines uh, much more uh, vulnerable uh, to sex trafficking, sexual abuse, uh, domestic violence. And the, the problem is very complex. And so as we unpack it, we also need to be really open-minded and take it from a socio-ecological um, system or framework as Nancy uh, mentioned earlier and what I've seen is that it's important as we look at interventions as we come up with policies as we come up with you know um, ensuring protection for victims we really also need to get to the root of it and I, I feel really privileged to have seen it up close not from sort of an academic standpoint but I saw how um, the victims, uh, how child abuse, how sexual abuse, how trafficking of women, how it's deeply rooted on inequality between men and women. Um, that, for me, uh, is really 
the core of it. So for example, in my experience, we had a chance to rescue um, a lot of girls who were trafficked for sex. And um, the reason that they became vulnerable to that is because, um, you know, the Philippines as a developing nation, there is a lot of poverty. And even in the homes, as the, the, they belong to families with lots of children, and the parents, because of meager resources, prioritize the education of the male children, thinking that, you know, with limited amount of resources, they'd better just put the boys to school because the boys could help out more and later on will be heads of their families. Whereas the girls, it will be okay for them to drop out. So from that very point, right in itself, the girls in the, you know, especially in rural areas, coastal areas here are marginalized already. And because they are dropped, they drop out from school, they're not educated, then they become vulnerable to predators, to sex traffickers in the community. So it starts from there. And then you see so many layers of norms in society where um, there's still a very strong patriarchal culture um, that started with our country through colonial times and even until today, even it's still very strong, which basically just shows us that um, there's still this strong belief, especially in you know further, farther flung areas that um, the males, the men, are more superior. It's basically that, that there is headship of the men and which brings women now to a lower um, level of just being subsumed under men. And, and so it's this kind of thinking that makes it acceptable even for very highly, you know, like prominent people to, to come up sometimes with misogynistic statements or think things that make it acceptable um, for women to just be um, treated as sources of entertainment or, you know, sex objects. So these are like the extreme things that I've seen. But um, at the same time, I've seen how these gender norms can actually, we have an opportunity to reframe them. And in, in my experience, it really is important to go down to the community level and invest in empowering and widening the thinking, um, not only of girls, not only of girl children and telling them that they are strong, they're equal, they're empowered, and they have the same human rights as everyone, but investing in the, you know, empowering and widening the thinking of boys. <laughs> because um, many times I've seen, even here in the Philippines in our NGO circles, um, it's the women <laughs> that are very much easier to invite, you know, to bring to the table, have these discussions. And the men are, you know, like, the boys or you know the men or the fathers are busy working but i think that's a part that it's super important for me in the prevention side and I, I really think that um a lot of patience and a lot of um dynamic thinking has to be invested there because they are the future you know generation and there is we've seen a lot of changes as well in that because um and girls start at home in communities, then it will go a long way. Great. Thanks, Mia. That's a really rich addition. And I think that in particular, your comments around engaging men and boys is, I'm sure, relevant for everyone. Um, we might move to the second question that I've got, Gina, which I'll direct to you in the first instance, but I'd really love to hear Nancy and Mia's comments, um, responses as well. But how do you see more diverse, inclusive, and local responses changing the GBV space? I think that certainly uh, lo local responses, I mean, people deciding, I think that's what's important in terms of, um, you know, I just wanted to pick up also on um, Mia's point is, is the, the value of seeing some of these changes. I was just reflecting on, um, you know, this, uh, the, the, the different powerful settings that we have. So Fiji um, recently uh, won the um, the Fijiana, which is the um, the women's rugby team. They uh, recently won a um, oh they 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 got the a medal in the Olympics, and we were just so thrilled with with their they did a fantastic work. And um, it was, it you know, reiterated what can be done when you show or you highlight or you role model um, 
you know, groups that are in the in the sports setting, or you have powerful role models that you know girls can do uh, all of this. Girls can uh, empower and be empowered and be uh, inspired. So I think those were some of the things I would thought in terms of you know education and the importance of um, uh, sports. But um, in terms of uh, how is it that we can m make sure that these are the that that we have uh, locally led changes and that we are involved in in the process, I just want to highlight an example from when uh, in sort of legislative change, we had a uh, included in our uh, programming the role of a consultative dialogue where we could um, get people from various um, um, groups or people groups that were marginalized and they were involved in sharing with uh, judges and sharing with magistrates how is it that the law impacts on them that when they come to face the law that when they are trying to access services how they are treated um, and what is it that the, that they get treated how, how is it that they experience the law so I think some of these processes of uh, making sure that people are included, that you uh, include them in, um, in in hearing their voices. What is it that they, how, what are their experiences? Um, when you are um, making sure that those platforms or those processes are inclusive, then we will be able to hear um, their voices. Then we will be able to design programs and uh, design responses that would meet the needs, especially of those who are uh, marginalized and, and, and excluded. Thank you. Thanks, Gina. There are a couple of really good examples. Um, I was wondering, Nancy and Mia, do you have examples of where you've seen sort of really inclusive local responses have an impact on GBV? Okay, I'll go ahead. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, similar to uh, Gina, uh, we, I have seen how the responses really need to be local. Um, here, for example, uh, in, in the problem of uh, sex trafficking of children, of girls, sexual abuse, uh, one of the ways that uh, we've done uh, in previous programs that I've led um, is doing it from what we call here a bibinka approach. So bibinka in our culture is like a rice cake, a native rice cake, and it is cooked with charcoal from the top and the bottom. So it always has to be this bibinka approach where, for example, we talk about the issues in the very local, local setting, you know, bringing together stakeholders, local police, local students, local teachers, local parents, local um, uh, uh, mayors, etc., and figuring and letting them um, understand what are the issues surrounding children here and letting them come together and empowering and being participatory. So I see that it has to be participatory. It has to be empowering. It cannot be um, sort of moralizing or dictating because that just never works. Like after a certain funding is done, then it's done too. But if it is something like meeting the local community where they're at and walking alongside them, I see that that is much more effective. And so that is in the like micro level, but I've also seen through the years that we cannot just limit our work to the community level because so much of the decision-making, especially in our country where laws, where you know budgets of government are very centralized, a lot of advocacy needs to be done in the higher echelons of society as well. And so through the years, I've been very passionate about bringing the stories, bringing the learnings that we have from the community, the realities of community, to the highest levels of government. So one example would be um, partnerships that we've had with our court systems that are established and administered by our Supreme Court. So throughout the country, we have family courts that hear cases of sexual violence on children and women, et cetera. And it, part of that education is opening the minds of the judges, of the court personnel, of the prosecutors, of the realities of the survivors, because it's all intertwined. The reason why some victims don't wanna go forward is because they feel that once they go through the justice system, that they are severely re-traumatized, that there is stigma. And so we can't just keep um, advocating down below in the micro level without 
advocating and opening the minds of the people who actually hold the keys for the wheels of justice to turn. So we do a lot of engagement. We do a lot of um, capacity building and just sharing these stories and even basic little tools like helping um, prosecution go smoother by, for example, um, providing anatomically correct dolls so that the children who are victims of violence don't have to you know, do it in a very painstaking and very um, humiliating way. So things like that. So it's like um, cooking the rice cake from the very, very uh, micro level, but at the same time um, in the top level society in an engaging and empowering and participatory way. Great. Thank you, Mia. That's another, those are some great examples. Nancy, I know it'd be good to hear from you. I mean, when you started, you touched on the work that you're doing with to sort of empower yeah. women to access services, but also the work you're doing, for example, with community health workers to strengthen their ability to provide services to women. But I'd love to hear your exa some examples from you of what you've seen work at local levels. Yeah. Thanks, Mia and Gina and Jackie. I think I'm really happy to hear from both of you. The examples that you're sharing, I think some of those were already applied in PNG, but what might not be happening is the strengthening of those systems and those uh, approaches that are already in there. Because if we were in a uh, in an organizational setting, these are structured settings where you can utilize the systems, the systems that can be able to address where the GBV cases are. So it's not only starting with a GBV case, it could be the inequalities that are embedded in there. So maybe the differences in there that slowly uh, accumulates to the actual GBV. So I was thinking from the experiences that I have, maybe more into the systems. So systems should integrate gender into their programs. The organizations should be inclusive of their gender programs and disability programs to have more visibility. So having a visibility is the issue. Um, I've also seen because when you see uh, when we see women and if they opt to take on the silence as an option and, and if there is no mechanism to come out and we might not be encouraging if it's uh, the women programs are not visible disability programs are not visible so people could have that space to speak because not everything you could report directly there's a fear of um, uh, the fear that associates the type of GBV that comes along with it. So having it more visible, there's a group of people that talked about it. Then it's really, really encouraging for women to speak. And then we have, I agree with Mia when you say engage boys, you, male engagement. So I also work in male advocacy spaces where um, we utilize the opposite of the approaches, meaning that we cannot use the actual traditional male approaches or the male norms, but you use it a different way. So I've used the example like there was a program called um, Safe Motherhood for Women, and I, I call it a Safe Motherhood for Men. So instead of teaching women, you have to teach men on the danger signs. What is the, and what is not safe for men? So. In PNG culture, we, th we think that men uh, are in control of their resources. They all that prestige and that honor of being a man. So I'm a man, I can do this. So if you think you are a man, you protect your own women and support them in that manner. So, so if you see the da danger signs as a man, how do you approach that danger sign to show that you are ac actually safe and you are healthy as a man. So men's engagement, men's sexual health, very important so that they themselves recognize their own health needs and they also recognize their uh, family's health needs, especially the women. And if there's a girl child, then they could. So those are some kind of um, uh, models that came along when, it's, when you do a targeted messaging and targeted approach, but taking the opposite of the traditional normal approaches. So like what you said, we don't do education and don't do awareness, but you do something more transformative in the way you try to engage people. So, so as it is, gender always revolves and it's always changing. It doesn't stay the same. Our approaches also need to change ear and ears and then where there's new cases that come along approaches also change like the cases of uh, complex human trafficking uh, 
we have a little um, number of human trafficking that it might increase later on, but for preparedness, we might as well learn from what the uh, Philippines is doing for the country. And when I'm talking about visibility, I refer to, we don't really talk about women in leadership. So if we see a general issue of women participation, women involvement at leadership level, women making decisions and women making decisions, you all on the senior uh, position. So according to World Health Organization's um, findings, 70% of women makes up the employment space in health. And gender-based uh, justice stock take from PATH program, we also have the similar findings where lots of women are in the health space, but don't hold on to the senior roles. So when you, we don't see women taking you know, on senior roles, we can't address GBV because men cannot talk about it. Sorry, I'm a bit, I uh, talk direct because I want to see that men talk about GBV. So men give that space, say that women, you come and talk about GBV here. So if we were to change those kind of approach, di different um, say behavior change strategies, different strategies that come along, alongside socio-ecological model. So socio-ecological uh, uh, socio model that brings on prevention all the way to um, influence and policies and the laws. So for Nancy, PNG, I would sorry, say. Can, I've got a, there's lots of questions coming in the chat. Okay, then I'll stop. I'll no, no, so can I get you to expand on one thing? So I've just got a follow up really. I don't want you to stop. Um, there's a question that's come in around how do we, what are some practical strategies to influence men in shifting norms, even if that is to create the space for women to lead? What have you seen that's worked in PNG? For well, now, like at this initial stage, I will not say men have taken a huge role into saying women should participate in this. At this stage, we women are asking men to give us that space. So in the stock take that we currently took, the Jesse stock take, men are actually saying women are facing GBV. But where is the mechanism? They want to be involved as some of the, uh, in some of those uh, discussions. Another thing we saw was um, male to have the space to talk about the issues because they cannot mention that in front of women. So they have the little space they, uh, to address GBV issues and whenever the questions arise, they could address it to women. So we have that space. So I've seen that work in the community level where you have the male engagement and the discussions are only led by men. So it's only men led groups that talk about this. And then they eventually, so what I've seen is the support they don't get. Um, they may lack the information they need to know. So lack of information is one of them. And they also lack the idea of where do they get the support to move on with uh, addressing gender-based violence? Because they are men, and most of the men will say gender is a woman's issue and only woman program kind of um, mentality. So I was thinking that maybe we should engage more men and increase that participation. And then boys to learn at this stage, at the adolescence going up. That's why when we did a school-based uh, safe school program, Actually, the target was towards boys. And they have to know, starting from adolescent, different stages that they come along with to understand the change in them. And they could be able to reflect that into the social change that they, they would be going through. So I was that's thinking great. more male engagement. Yeah, That's great. Thank you, Nancy. We've only we've nearly run out of time. We've had a Maybe I too much. There's so much in the chat. Um, it's obviously a topic that our, our audience is really passionate about, and I know we're just going to touch the surface. But um, Mia, can I throw back to you? I mean, I think Nancy's raised some good points around creating spaces for women to lead in, in addressing GBV. What have you, and, and also practical ways in which we can engage men. Can you talk a little bit about that from your perspective and, and experience? Sure. You know, interestingly here in the Philippines, the NGO space is really dominated by women. Uh, most of the executive director roles of NGOs are women. Um, you know, people are very vocal about these women. Um, you know, to be, to be quite candid, um, it is not easy to engage with um, uh, men even the communities to, to shift that paradigm because this is years of socialization you know like this is like layers and layers of 
um, a mindset of what women's roles are and what men's roles are and the equality is not going to be achieved just by having several sessions of you know like ba brown bags and all that but what i've seen that helps us is two things number one is finding local champions um finding champions in the community you know like open-minded fathers open-minded leaders in the community youth leaders especially and especially champions in um among people with positions of power, you know, like government officials, leaders who, who are first to show and demonstrate a mindset of equality between men and women. And the second, aside from finding champions in the different circles that we move in, I really think that it is so much um, better and more effective to invest in the future generation. Um, I, I, I feel that uh, if we have a systematic way of infusing, um, you know, like these principles of equality that are founded on um, treaties and international conventions, like um, the conventions on um, uh, elimination of discrimination against women, uh, UN conventions on human rights, you know, these are like universal principles. And if we are able to break it down in simple ways on just basic equality, dignity, respect, uh, among teaching that to the new to the younger generation, I think that is so much more um, effective because um, we've seen how that can really uh, be something that could evolve and something that you know young people could um, inspire each other on and creating leaders, creating you know like investing in the the young people, um, how they could interpret this you know and how they could actually lead the way for us to to um be more um responsive and be more um uh take more initiative in protecting women and boys and having this equal um mindset great thank you unfortunately we've just run out of time um so i'll have to wrap it up although i know we could have get could have kept going for another hour on these incredibly important topics there's some very rich commentary. There's some great questions, but also some very rich commentary in the chat box. I know for everyone who's present, we will be sending out an email in a few days um, with a, a recording of the event, with a copy of APPS, JEDC New, JEDC Framework. But we also might summarise some of the um, comments in the chat. There's some good references, for example, to the IFCs respectful workplaces website that might be useful resources for all of us who are passionate about this topic. I think we touched on some really good issues. Um, I, you know, one thing that really struck me was the issues are, are very similar in all of the places where each of us work. And like I live in Australia, we've had a lot of issues in Australia this year around gender-based violence, around safety in the workplace for women. So all of the issues that you're saying resonate for me as an Australian woman, um, I have to say. So those similarity of those challenges across our diverse countries and cultural contexts is um, really powerful. I also thought the comment around that, it, that at, the, at the root of all of this is inequality between men and women, and we have to be able to address so that harmful harmful norms and um, strengthen the empowerment of women if we want to make any progress in this space. I thought that really resonated. Um, I thought there was a really good conversation around um, looking for local solutions and making sure we can engage with local communities in a non-judgmental way, in a respectful way, in an inclusive way, in an empowering way. Um, and work with communities where they're at, but also work at structural levels across the system within our organisations and within government. Um, we talked a bit about the important for importance, for example, of legislative change for protections around gender-based violence. We also had a really good discussion around um, the need to engage men and boys in this discussion. Um, and I thought there were some very good examples of what we can do to do better on that. Uh, and and I really think, Mia, maybe your summary at the end, that if we can engage you on these basic human principles of equality and dignity and respect, we can, we can make progress on this really critical, important issue. But 
can I just wrap up by thanking each of you for your incredible, for sharing your stories and for the incredible work that you do on this issue that I know we all care about deeply. It's hard working on these topics, I know, um, but I just want to thank you for sharing your experience with all of us today. It's been a real honour to hear from each of you. I also just want to finish by thanking Lisa Gibson at Act Associates who's put a lot of work in the background to organising this session. So thank you, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.